Our next speaker is Jessica Jock. Uh, we were here before the break. We just heard her speak on another subject, but uh, she'll now be presenting uh, a talk entitled Assessing Reproductive Health in Lake Sturgeon in the St. Lawrence River Area of Concern. Uh, Jessica is with the St. Regis Tribe, I'm sorry, St. Regis Mohawk Tribe Environmental Division. Thank you. Good afternoon. No, not afternoon. Yet. It's still morning. I like the break. <laughs> so, um, I'm, I'm probably going to sit back down to give this talk as well, only because I think I have more comfort when I'm looking at the slides and walking through it. But um, as, as I was introduced, I'm Jessica Jock. I work for the San Francisco Tribes Environment Division. In 2010, we received a Great Lake Restora Restoration Initiative grant um, to uh, to look at lake sturgeon restoration in the St. Lawrence River area of concern. And those who were just at my last talk, I, I'll probably have, I think I have another figure in here identifying what the AOC is. It's one of the first objectives at the top. Second objective, uh, lake sturgeon significance to Mohawk. If you were my, my last talk as well, then you probably have heard enough of that. Uh, number three is study objectives for assessing lake sturgeon health and contaminant burdens to eggs. Our project team, our field findings, and the comparison to a recent publication by Don Tillett and others um, looking at the, the paper title. I'm going to read it out loud right now. Actually, no, I'm not because there's a lot of words that I don't want to read. <laughs> I just realized basically. <laughs> I'll, I'll summarize. The paper is Sensitivity of Lake Sturgeon, Early Life Stages to PCV 126 and Dioxin. Um, adverse effects, basically. So for those who aren't familiar with an AOC, I'm assuming most in this room have probably worked in some regards to one of the AOCs. The St. Lawrence River uh, area of concern is the one that I'm, I'm referring to today. It's a bi-national AOC, and for the most part, our work that we conduct is on the, the state side, not the, the Canadian side, but because Akwesasne is a unique territory uh, Mohawk territory that straddles both U.S. and Canada, where <coughs> half of the territory is in Ontario and Quebec, the other half of the territory is considered, you know, in, in what we identify as New York State. Here's, here's the international boundary. So it, it creates some uh, jurisdictional complexities as well as when looking at fisheries uh, management or contaminant burden and understanding your sources, um, what, is, what does that mean? And so, Akwesasne, in my last talk, I, I discussed uh, the Mohawk sturgeon fishermen and, and, um, and the use of, of lake sturgeon in the territory of Akwesasne. What I forgot to mention in the last talk, though, as well, is that, so when we're looking at legacy contaminants in our industrial sources, we have Alcoa West, um, and they had uh, different discharges through the outfalls into the Lower Grass River here. The Lower Grass River in, um, in Mohawk is called Niganjage, place of where the big fish, place of the big fish, and that's assumed to include lake sturgeon and some of the old salmon. And this still, this stretch of the river is still not remediated. We're still in remedial design in terms of uh, how to address the, the PCV concentrations. The, the record of decision includes uh, capping in the main channel and dredging in the near shore for anything greater than one parts per million PCBs. In 2016, and I'm probably going to forget the concentrations, but it was high. At Alpha 004, um, there were concentrations as high as, I think, 8,000 parts per million and sheens that were discovered in doing some of the characterization of the sediment cores to, to finish up remedial design. So there's still hot spots. There's still some really high <coughs> concentrated areas of PCBs. And then um, Alcoa East, uh, former Reynolds Metal, uh, the remedy was done in 2001. That uh, the remedy included cleanup for PCBs and PHs, and then General Motors. The, the remedy on the St. Lawrence was conducted in 1995. So, with the exception of this long seven-mile stretch of contaminated water uh, sediment, uh, the rest of the St. Lawrence uh, remediation has been completed. Um, I, let me just go back for those uh, when it comes to the egg take as well. That, that's done here at the Moses Saunders Power Dam. Uh, so I just spoke on the, the Mohawk cultural significance. I, again, just briefly, it's about community sharing. And there's, it's a living culture still, generational teachings of Lake Sturgeon uh, collection in the community and use. And, um, 
and, it, and there, there's still a lot of reverence for, for the, the consumption of lake sturgeon, and, and it's still done during different celebratory events. Um, and, and it's usually the first, when, when there's a, a gathering and a meal, it's usually the first thing to go. <laughs> Everybody makes sure that they get, get in line first for the lake sturgeon. Um, it's, it's smoked, um, smoked sturgeon. So um, the objectives for the, the contaminant study was, um, so it was to make progress on our understanding of overall lake sturgeon health, adult lake sturgeon health in the St. Lawrence River area of concern. So our field collection measures uh, was, was to include uh, morphological measures, external anomaly observations, your, your typical age, and then chemical measures uh, included lipids, percent lipids, PCB, uh, 155 condom nerve and analysis, mercury, dots and purines, organic chlorine pesticides, and PVDEs <coughs> in the virgin contaminant. And the proposal was to measure from late, 20 lake sturgeon that were collected from Mohawk sturgeon fishermen. And this, this was determined during 2011 roundtable group meetings with different uh, lake sturgeon experts and managers from federal, um, even uh, provincial, from Ontario, Quebec, uh, state, DEC, as well as ourselves and MCA to, to say how can we best get some of this data on contaminant burden um, in, in a way that's meaningful. And so because of the, the harvest from some of the Mohawk sturgeon fishermen, we, we decided that it was best if we could collaborate with the fishermen to collect 20 of the fish from there and then um, analyze the gonads, liver, and fillet, and then or if any eggs present, include the eggs as well. And then um, I'm going to jump to the third objective was for the, the eggs, also collect egg samples from any of the female sturgeon that were collected in that same year of the study with DEC during the egg take in the South Channel. Um, and then some of the other um, objectives of the study were to evaluate contaminant concentrations in the fillet samples that were harvested by the Mohawk fishermen because in 1995 there was a special fish, fish advisory for Mohawk population for lake sturgeon and the advisory basically advised do not eat uh, lake sturgeon, um, I think it was specific maybe to women and child so women of childbearing age and children should not eat any flesh or roe from the sturgeon because in the 70s to the 80s there were some fish that were collected with lay tissue concentrations of 4.9 parts per million PCBs and then some of the roe, which was traditionally consumed as well, um, had PCB concentrations as high as 8 parts per million um, and that was in the 80s. So, so in order to update the, the fish consumption advisory, we collected some of that data as well. And the fillet data was included in the, was it 2015, Tony, when uh, your office, in 2015, I'm just in 14, plus one of those years. There is, and it's on the website, the tribe's website, an updated um, Mohawk fish consumption advisory that does include sturgeon based on the results from 2012. Um, this is just a quick, we can go back to this, but your, your typical project team acknowledgement, but the, the importance of this is that there was a huge group, just like in any, every other presentation I've seen this week, um, you know, the collaborations and that relationship building is important amongst the agencies as well as the scientists. And um, so Cornell University, Dr. Paul Bowser, I have a slide on him in a minute. Um, they helped with the histology and, and understanding with, of how to extract the tissue for analysis. Clarkson University and Antonio Oswego uh, did the contaminant analysis. And then, like I said, there was a ton of discussion with other agencies, including DEC and NOAA and USGS, and, and both sides of the border for how to determine this study design. And originally, the proposal, so the, the yellow dots show, um, and this is just a general, this is basically just to say within the territory of Akwesasne, we'll collect um, this will be our sample location for eggs. We knew this was the sample location for eggs based on the egg take in the South Channel. And then we had hoped to have had a background uh, reference location, but that didn't work out in 2012. But there was some initial discussion on if we could make it work uh, with an additional, there was another collection effort at one time that was proposed, but it, it didn't work out. But for, for eggs specifically, so we have sample from here and here, but. Unfortunately, we don't have any background reference, so we only have samples within the area of contamination. So like I said, Dr. Bowser came into town, <laughs> and uh, he, um, he, he was a great assistance in, um, in, in helping 
This is uh, Jay Wilkins. He was he's basically our field technician at the time who did a lot of the work. He's responsible for making sure that we had QA, QC in the field during the collection, making sure there wasn't cross-contamination, documenting everything. With those details, if anybody's worked with contaminants, you know, are so important to making sure that um, you, you get the job done to, to get uh, good analytical results. This is uh, a photo of one of the, the Mohawk Sturgeon Fisherman Fish Box locations. This is the setup that we had designed. This is there on their residence and their property. And, and so for the 20 fish that were being collected for the overall contaminant analysis, the original objective was to work with them when they were, when they were harvesting and then, and then just, you know, collaborate from there. We would take the samples and then they keep the rest of the fish and use it how they normally would. Um, and so we would take our measurements and then this was from the egg take and then these are our sample bottles for submittal to the, the lab. Now, what happened with the collection of those 20 lake sturgeon from the Mohawk fishermen is, um, so you can see the, the May, I'm sorry, May 10th, those two fish were collected specifically for the histology with uh, Dr. Bowser and, and the identification on how to extract tissue. And then we worked with the sturgeon fisherman, but then unfortunately the sturgeon fisherman, um, I think he had some health problems and then he was away for work. And so you see there's a gap in time between when our samples were actually, uh, I say collected, but it was the date of the tissue collection. Because <coughs> when the, um, no, it's not necessarily the day that the sturgeon were collected in the field and brought to the fish box, it was the day of, of when we, we uh, took the tissue collection. So the results, um, here, just a couple things of note to highlight. I, uh, so that's why those are highlighted in yellow, and that most likely affected our weight. It's probably gonna, I haven't done any analysis yet, but it probably most likely affected the lipid content as well, um, percent, because they were in a fish box for an extended period of time, a small area. Um, and that's gonna be important for when uh, doing the analysis with contaminant concentrations, what that, that may have meant. Um, I highlighted, so I, I was speaking with, uh, with a colleague the other day and kind of just basically saying that there is almost an already self-observed uh, slot limit. Where So this is the, you see most of the fish are in the same size range. There's one large fish here, which was a female because we had asked for a large fish for our histo histopathology work. We specifically asked, go, like, get a, give us the biggest fish that you can find. Um, and then, this one uh, was probably done on the same premise of trying to get the largest fish, uh, but it, it wasn't released. Normally, the smallest and the largest fish are released during the, the um, collection by a certain fisherman. And then these three samples are the egg uh, collection at the cell channel and then the, the features of the adults. So just a quick figure, uh, picture depicting uh, from the, the fish that were harvested and um, and so then to compare the, the data, and just specific this report, uh, this presentation is only on the eggs. Um, just a brief summary of the, the tip till it, uh, document. Um, the objectives were to evaluate the risks of PCD and dioxin exposure on early life stages of lake sturgeon. This publication just came out in, uh, I think, September 2016. Uh, determine uh, contaminant thresholds of PCD-126 and TCDD in sturgeon that are associated with adverse effects on development, growth, behavior, and survival. And then looking at those endpoints, um, the you know because if, if you don't have healthy <laughs> uh, larvae and they, they can't if they have any kind of effects to the heart or or other, then uh, they won't be able to have a good predator uh, response and, and uh, remove themselves. And so they're probably if they do survive to hatch to larvae phase, they may not be strong swimmers, and that's a concern with the, the contaminant thresholds. It's basically the story. <laughs> uh, the methods that the tell it used was a dosing study, and it's all in situ. I'm gonna just skip ahead because I wanna make sure that we get a chance if there's any time for questions. Um, and, and the summary of the story is that lake sturgeon are three to four fold more sensitive to PCD-126 and two times more sensitive to TCDD, diapsins, and shovel nose and pallet sturgeon. This was the first time in situ study I'm kind of looking at these contaminant threshold and adverse effects. Uh, so the results from our 2012 eggs, 
Um, and I have a, a note right here because I just want to, I want to make the group aware that I am seeking verification on the units, but I do believe these units are nanograms per gram because it would match the total PCB concentrations anyway. So total PCB concentrations in the eggs from our five samples, the south channel, the SC is your, your label identification for the south channel. These two are from the two female fish that were collected by the Mohawk Southern fishermen. It's this number here we want to look at. So the, the TELIT uh, publication basically said your medium lethal dose uh, for PCB-126 is 5.49. And our concentrations, if we just looked at the egg concentrations from the cell channel during the collection that year, uh, 4.87 was the highest. But then from the, the non, uh, how would we best phrase this, but the, they were eggs within the female body, but they, they were not um, in a stage yet to, um, to spawn, are definitely at that threshold and of concern. So, oh, and then, whoop, uh, ah. So the range is 3.9 to 7.4. So again, looking at this 4.87, if we're looking at the lower range of the, media, of the lethal dose, then that, that is a concern as well. So the next test is basically uh, for, for more critical review of the 2012 chemical data as well as comparison um, to the, the literature and how does that apply and how can that be used for updating our understanding of beneficial uses of the degradation of fish and wildlife populations in our ASC. And then do we want to consider future chemical analysis to complement any of the annual uptake and understanding of any, any potential failures of in the hatchery or other. Um, so with that, I just leave a photo. I want to make sure that we can all note the picture of the king during the egg take. And I included some of these muscle photos because I learned Kurt was going to be our moderator, and I know he likes his muscles. And with that, I'll take any questions. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. 